Hello folks, welcome back to Reaper Minis TV. We're going to jump right into the reviews with a figure that is a reissue, or at least a partial reissue, of a previously seen Reaper figure. This Cyclops is a two-piece figure. It's part of the P65 line, and he comes as the base figure itself, which is almost everything. And then in his left hand, he carries a very large staff with a spiked ball, almost an oversized mace that he's carrying in his left hand. And that goes right into place in a ball and socket joint right at the wrist. So really no assembly issues as far as putting the figure together. And you have a little bit of range of motion with the, the joint itself to where you can angle his big beat down stick facing outward or inward or however you like. Cleaning was pretty much limited to a couple of mold lines that you can see are visible, but they were taken care of without too much trouble at all. It comes with a 40 millimeter plastic square base, and the reissue part of this guy is the Cyclops and a Goblin Mage are part of the Revan army for Warlord. And I've actually got the the original, I guess you could say, version of this in my Revan army. There's a little Goblin Mage with a pointy hat, and he's got a chicken head on a staff, and he's got a little voodoo puppet that he's holding out. You can see the original model here, but they re-released just the Cyclops in the P65 line if you don't want the Goblin Mage. And who knows, maybe they'll release the Goblin Mage on his own in case you don't want the Cyclops. But anyway, the Cyclops here is a little bit bigger and beefier than ogre-sized, but I think he'd fit in well as a bruiser or some kind of character model in an Ogre Kingdoms army for Warhammer Fantasy if you wanted to go that route. Obviously, drop him into a dungeon and beat on player characters with him if you want to do that. But if you're also looking for another, maybe a little smaller Cyclops, you also have this option here from Reaper. And this guy is a little bit smaller, but also a little bit cheaper on the wallet if that's a consideration for you. All right, next up we're going to jump into a couple of Pathfinder reviews. And the first one is the Skinsaw Man. This is a single-piece miniature, and it just evokes a really cool story in my mind before I even did any kind of Google-foo and looked up the Skinsaw murders from the Pathfinder game or anything like that. This guy just looks very cool in an evil and kind of demented sort of way. Now, in his right hand, he's carrying what looks like to be a very large straight razor. And in his left hand, he's got a mask. You can see he has a large formal coat on and uh, the ruffles along his neck and a high collar. So he's probably at some kind of ball or some kind of you know big to-do where he's going to commit his gruesome murders. The figure itself needed very little in the way of cleaning. Just took a couple of minutes to get rid of a couple bits of metal from the casting process and some very faint mold lines. But in addition to kind of thinking how cool the model looks, I also had an idea of how to move or port the figure over into a superhero game as a villain. And my thought is this. Cut the mask out of his left hand, or pretty much cut the whole hand off at the wrist. Replace that with a heavy pistol. And then I've got him there now with a pistol and the straight razor. And paint him up as the Joker. Now, he's got that long tongue coming out of his mouth, so he's very much not your normal kind of Joker model that you might think of, but in an exaggerated or extra demented sort of way, I think he'd look pretty cool like that. And I can just about guarantee that this figure in that capacity will find his way into a DC Adventures scenario pretty soon. Our next Pathfinder figure is the Red Mantis Assassin, and this is also a single-piece miniature. It is a humanoid bug mix, and he's carrying two serrated swords. They're really large serrated blades, one in each hand, and he's hunched over a little bit, almost in a about-to-strike position. He's wearing pretty light-looking armor and also has a couple small daggers that are on his thigh. He has a somewhat tattered cloak that he's wearing. Now, there were some extra bits of metal that needed to be cleaned up from the casting process, and you can see where, right at about knee level, where there's a piece of metal that comes out from the outside of his leg and goes to each side of the swords that'll need to be clipped off and cleaned, so you want to be careful when you're doing that, because there is quite a bit of little intricate detailing down on at least the left leg side where the little metal tab connects over to the leg and the sword. Just on where the armor plates are, there is a lot of extra little detailing, almost like filigree, but not really the same on this model. Now, as a regular D&D or high fantasy kind of player character model, I don't really know if he has a real proper place there, but if in Pathfinder you're going to use a Red Mantis Assassin, and then obviously this is the miniature for you, but I do think 
that this figure could be ideal in a Dark Sun campaign using the 4th edition D&D rules. So I think for that he'd be good. You might even be able to drop him into a game of Gamma World. Just pick that up, so I'm going to have to check that out. And all around a good figure. I just think it has a very specific usability that goes along with it. All right, on to some Dark Heaven Legends blister packs now. And this first one are some trick-or-treat mouselings. And there's already been a couple mouseling releases so far. There is a box set of mouselings that you can pick up that has a whole bunch of adventurers in it. There's also a group of mouselings that were released specifically for Reaper's Artist Con that was in late October. And unfortunately, you can only pick it up there. Maybe they'll release them outside of Special Edition. Who knows? But in that set, you had a zombie hero or a zombie killer hero, excuse me, that had a chainsaw and there was two zombie mouselings. Well, in this set, you have two trick-or-treaters and they're each single piece miniatures. One is a witch and you can see she's carrying a bag full of candy and has her big pointy floppy hat that's covering most of the top of her face. And the other one is dressed up as a ghost. You can see he's wearing uh, just basically a big sheet with some holes in it and he's got his little pumpkin that holds his trick-or-treat candy there. They are cute little mouselings and nice additions to the existing line of mouselings so I can see the attraction that people have for them. I just don't know what I would use them for right now. And now we come to some figures that I know exactly what I'm going to be doing with them. This is a three pack of some men at arms and you get three single piece miniatures in here. One has a spear and shield, one is carrying a halberd with no shield and the other has a sword and shield. And what I plan to do with these is get some more of them and use them to bulk up units of men at arms or actually create a whole unit of men at arms for a Bretonian army for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. I already have a big 50 man strong block of men at arms for my Bretonian army, but I think a unit of 25 of these guys painted up a little bit differently and just they obviously look a little bit different, so I'm going to use a different color scheme on them than my existing ones and just have them come from a different province in Bretonia. I think they'll work fine, and I really have no problem at all mixing miniatures from different lines or manufacturers as different units, and sometimes even within the same units. I just think these look different enough from the regular Bretonian men-at-arms that they look really good as a unit by themselves. And there are also a couple of, of other varieties of men-at-arms. Their armament, some have maces and shields that you can drop in there into a unit of these guys. And I think it would not be hard at all to convert together a standard bearer and a musician for the unit. And also with some careful clipping and a little bit of trim here and there, you can pretty easily get these three guys to fit onto 20 millimeter square bases. So I think the idea of using them as a block of Bretonian men at arms is right on. And here we have a blister pack that is another three pack. And in here you get three single piece mummies. One is carrying a short sword in his right hand and sort of reaching out with his left. You have one with both hands up, sort of come, about to come down and smash somebody. And the third is also unarmed, but he's got one, his left arm, sort of reaching out to grab somebody. The one with his two arms up is the most still wrapped up of the three mummies. His bandages are the most intact of the three of them. The one with the sword and the one that's reaching out, the third one that I talked about, both have some of their face exposed to where you can see their jaw and their open mouth as they're coming towards their victims. Obviously, you could use them as mummies in any kind of fantasy game. In the Nefsakar army for Warlord, you could also use them in a group of Awakened, which are basically just mummies or part of their grunt troops. And I think you could probably get some mileage out of them in a Tomb King's army for Warhammer Fantasy, even though... Only one out of the three here carries a sword, and generally people think about the Tomb King Tomb Guards as skeletons, but I think you could use them as mummies without a problem at all. Don't know if I could really drop them into a Vampire Count's army, but just as a nice change of pace or some extra flavor or uniqueness in an army, I could see them getting dropped in there and looking pretty cool. Okay, everybody, thanks for watching this episode of Reaper Minis TV. We'll see you next time.